All right, everyone. So welcome back. We're going to take a look at Cloud Compare today. So this will be our first look at Cloud Compare as a point cloud manipulation software. And today we'll be looking at getting data in, uh, some of the options to get it in, and some basic navigation around the program. So whether you're on Windows or Mac, uh, you can open up Cloud Compare. So right now we're using uh, version 2.10.2 uh, on Windows, but uh, the interface should be the same on uh, all platforms. So I have mine set up uh, a little bit differently probably than the default. Um, I don't honestly remember what the default settings were, but I know I've changed my toolbars around. So if you see a toolbar uh, or me going for a toolbar that isn't in the same place on your machine, uh, that's totally okay. Uh, you're welcome to move those toolbars to uh, wherever you like on your screen. All of the toolbars are dockable. Um, so the first thing to uh, kind of get familiar with is the basic layout of the screen. So on the main window here is the 3D view. So this is where our point clouds uh, will show up. Uh, up on the top, left here is what's called the db tree or database tree and so that is going to be all of our different layers and folders and we can rearrange things um, in there as we see fit uh, the properties window down here once we have a point cloud loaded will actually show us um, some of the display properties of the point clouds and let us change uh, which attributes are displayed um, and do a lot of fun things in there so we'll get to that probably in the next video um, the bottom here is the output console, and this is actually probably, for beginner users, probably the least useful thing uh, in the whole program. So if you want to go ahead and X out of that, so over in the um, corner of the console bar here, you can actually click the X and get rid of that window so that you have more space on your screen. So. In order to get a point cloud in, it's uh, simply uh, going to the open uh, menu up here. So I can show you that um, that icon up here. So just up in the upper right hand corner here, the open um, file dialog pops up. And so in here, um, you can navigate to uh, the point clouds that you uh, want to use or want to find. And so um, Cloud Compare will take in uh, just about any file type uh, that has uh, some kind of 3D data associated with it. So just here in the file browser, you can see that some of the, the more common ones are uh, ASCII clouds, so uh, CSV files or XYZ files or points files. So those are basically just text files with 3D data in it. Uh, the other most common that you'll probably use a lot in Cloud Compare are uh, LAS or LAST files. So those are LIDAR files. And uh, Cloud Compare can put, read both the, the .LAS and the LAZ, the compressed versions. Um, other ones that you can read in here are PLY meshes, uh, OBJ meshes, STLs for 3D printing. Um, DXF geometry from CAD. Um, uh, and then Cloud Compare also has a lot of, you can read in images and even uh, shape files from GIS as well. Um, so we won't get into too many of those uh, in this uh, series, but the primary ones that we'll be using are uh, ASCII point clouds and LIS uh, clouds. The one more important one um, is right at the top of that file list is the, the cloud compare entities, a .bin file. And so these are, if you save a cloud compare kind of document, if you want to think about it like that, um, with all the different point cloud entities in it, uh, those will save as a bin file. So you can actually open up um, a whole series of point clouds as a kind of stored bin file. I will warn you that those can get rather large um, if you have multiple big point clouds in there. So be careful when you're saving out point clouds. So in order to get a point cloud in, 
Um, all you have to do is find the point cloud that you're interested in. And so for this um, demonstration, I'm just going to use a uh, point cloud that I used for some research uh, of a river. And so in this case, this is a CSV file. So I'm gonna click on that and open. Okay. And since this is a CSV file, we get prompted with a um, kind of an, another dialogue asking us to kind of identify the different columns in our CSV file. So in this case, uh, you can see that my CSV file here has a header row. So I have an X column, a Y column, and a Z column, and then a bunch of different attribute columns out uh, the side here. Um, so in order to get this to read in correctly, um, oftentimes you have to um, tell it uh, which columns uh, belong to which values. Uh, so in this case, it's, it usually tries to guess and it does a pretty good job at guessing which is the X coordinates, which is the Y coordinates, and which is the Z coordinates for the points. Um, but if you need to change those for any reason, like let's say you've got Y, X, Z, if you click on the drop down menus here at the top, you can actually change the different um, field types. So whether you want to change this to the Y coordinates or the X coordinates or the Z coordinates, or there's other types down here too. So if you have red, green, blue values for point cloud colors, uh, you can do that down here. Or um, another kind of popular one for a lot of attribute data is just what's called a scalar value. So it's way down here at the bottom. So in this case, um, it's guessed that it's is a comma separated file. So down here in the bottom, you can see that it's got a comma in the separator uh, field. And then the next to last option down here at the bottom is skip lines. And so in this case, we have a header row. So we actually want to skip that first line because it's not valid data. And so if we hit the up arrow on that, you can see that that gets rid of that first line and then another interesting thing that pops up um, or pops to be available is this extract scalar field names from the first line. So if you have attributes um, out in your point cloud, um, it can actually extract the names of those um, from that first line automatically. So that's uh, pretty slick. So we'll go ahead and hit apply on this one. And then for most geospatial data, you actually will get this, uh, it's called the global shift and scale dialog to pop up. And basically Cloud Compare tries to uh, keep things simple in terms of coordinates. And so for large geospatial coordinates, so those associated with like UTM or state plane or, um, the, uh, or other kind of gridded uh, coordinate systems that have very, very large uh, coordinate values, um, Cloud Compare will actually do what's called this global shift and scale to actually kind of uh, subtract out a constant from each of the different X, Y, and Z values in order to get the point cloud to display properly and not take up too much memory. Um, so this is usually a good thing to do. I wouldn't suggest uh, skipping it because if you do, uh, as you can see, it's um, the, the warning at the top of the screen here is that the coordinates are too big and original precision may be lost. So if you're using giant coordinates, so in this case, this is on the British National Grid. And so our X coordinates are in the range of 338,000 and our Y coordinates are 272,000. And so what Cloud Compare will do is subtract out those constants so that we're left with coordinates that are a little bit more manageable in the kind of 29 and 18 range rather than the 300,000 range. So Cloud Compare does a pretty good job at suggesting a constant to remove from this. Um, and we'll look at importing another file and applying that same offset to it as well. Um, and so it's pretty smart in its ability to do this. So usually I just go with the suggested, um, unless you're looking for a very specific offset here. So if you say yes, that will apply that shift in scale and then it will import uh, that, cloud, that point cloud. So depending on your machine, this can take uh, a matter of seconds or 
for larger point clouds, uh, maybe a minute or so, but it usually loads fairly quickly. And so what will pop up is kind of the default view of the point cloud. So here you can see this is our river. So um, in this case, our river is flowing from the left side down to the right side. And um, if we click on the, the point cloud over here in our database tree, you can see that our properties window now gets populated with a bunch of different stuff. And so uh, if we just go down uh, the list here, the first thing is visible or not. And so that's the same as the checkbox up here in the DB tree. So if you uncheck that, um, that will turn on and off the point cloud. Or if you have multiple entities kind of nested over here, you can actually turn them off individually uh, with that visible tab. Um, the next uh, important one here is the colors. So um, if you're Point Cloud has both uh, scalar field attributes and RGB data. This is where you can switch between the two. And so mine has RGB data, so you, I can switch it to RGB colors. And so here, if we zoom in, you can start to see the colors of our uh, river. So you can see some of the sediment here on the banks, but then the in-channel in portions uh, are this kind of brown-green color. So if we switch back to our scalar fields, um, in this case, if we'll go down to the bottom and look at which scalar field is uh, active, and that's the current one that's going to be displayed with that scalar field. So some other interesting things uh, that you'll find in here are some information about the point cloud itself. So uh, what, it, uh, what the number of points are in the point cloud. So this is 1.9 million uh, points. Um, you can also change the size of the individual points. So if I zoom in here, you can start to see that we get, uh, start to see individual points. But if we change the point size here, that actually changes the size of the points in our display. So usually I just leave these at default. I'll show you another way to change those in a minute uh, globally across all the data sets, but usually just leave point size at default. And then lower down in our properties window here is our, um, our scalar field. And so here you can see that this, this point cloud has 10 different attribute fields. Um, and this is just as an example. Um, your, your point cloud can have anywhere from zero up to as many as you want to add on. Um, but for the different scalar fields, you can use this drop down menu to pick the scalar field that you want to display. And so if you want to look at, if you're looking at a LIDAR file, you might have scalar fields in here of like intensity and return number and classification. Uh, this is some derived data from a bathymetric correction. So I've got uh, some kind of random ones in here. So things like water surface elevations and the original point cloud elevations versus the corrected uh, bathymetric uh, depths. Um, so you can choose which point cloud you, or which scalar field you wanna display um, in uh, this menu, drop down menu here. So in this case, we're just gonna look at the uh, original uh, Z values for the point cloud. And then the color scale, uh, you can choose a uh, custom color ramp um, to display the colors. So this will display from low to high based on the values in the, uh, in the, the, the scalar field. And so you can change these to be whatever you like. Um, there's an editor in here as well. So you can actually create custom color ramps if you like as well. Uh, we won't be going over that today, but you can change these uh, color ramps to be uh, whatever you like. The default is this blue, green, yellow, red, which is pretty good for most things. Um, and then down here at the bottom of the screen, you can actually see the display parameters for that scalar field. And so this is kind of a histogram of the different values in that specific scalar field. And we'll look at that um, in a little bit more depth um, in terms of displaying uh, specific attributes um, in a later video. So in terms of basic navigation um, of the point cloud, uh, you can use your mouse wheel, uh, or if you've got a touchpad, you can use your kind of finger scrolling 
to uh, zoom in and out. Uh, so I'm just using my mouse wheel heel here to zoom in and out. And then the other ba two basic kind of maneuvers in this 3D point cloud space are if you left click, you'll rotate the point cloud. And so this is a, a kind of true three dimensional rotation. So you can click and drag and rotate the point cloud around its center point. Uh, we'll look at how to kind of change that center point in just a minute. But the, so that basic left click and drag will rotate around and then if you you can zoom in and out um, based on uh, wherever you are kind of rotated around um, as well so you can zoom in and out and rotate uh, just the same so the next uh, basic command is a right click which is a pan uh, move so if you right click and drag you can pan left and right or up and down uh, on the screen and so zooming way out, again, you can just, you can move that point cloud kind of around in a, in a panning fashion. Um, so there are some default views as well for the 3D view um, that you'll find on your toolbar. Mine is over here on the left-hand side, but these kind of orange squares are some of the default views. And so if you, um, hover over these, you can see what they are. So the first one here is a top view. So if you click on that, that'll be a top down view of the point cloud. Uh, the front view is in this case for most landscape and geospatial data is a kind of a, a side profile view from the front. Um, another profile view from the left hand side, the back, the right hand side. And lastly is you can look at a bottom view from underneath. Now for geospatial data, that's not particularly useful, but for other 3D modeling tasks, uh, that might be useful. Uh, the last two down here are a front and back isometric view. So this is kind of a tilted view uh, that's really useful in, in 3D CAD and 3D, other 3D kind of design uh, softwares is this isometric view. So kind of a, a tilted uh, angled view. Um, so usually if I get totally screwed up in where I'm at or if I'm zoomed in way too far and get kind of out of whack, oftentimes the best bet is just to go over here and set top view to get the, the top down view, which is what we're used to as, as geographers and geospatial scientists. Um, so that's kind of the, the basics of some of the view, um, the viewport stuff. Um, if you do get completely lost, let's say you get turned around and your point cloud is completely off the screen. Um, if you click on one of your point clouds that you want to look at, you can actually hit the magnifying glass over here and it'll zoom and center to selected entities. So that'll bring you back to kind of a default, uh, the default view that you started with. So um, one other kind of navigation thing that you can uh, manipulate is the center of rotation. And so over here on the left hand side up on my toolbar here, you'll see that there's two uh, little crosshairs. I can show you those over here. So there's one that says auto and one that's just blank. And so the auto one I think is, def is checked by default. Um, I actually usually turn that off uh, just because it can screw up in uh, certain situations. So I usually turn the auto off. And then the other one, the, the top kind of blank one, is what's called the pick the center of rotation or pick rotation center. And so if you click on that, then you can click on anywhere in your point cloud and kind of establish the, a new center of rotation. And so with that tool active, you can see down here in the bottom, it says pick a point to be used as the rotation center. Uh, click on the icon again to, to cancel. So if you click on this again, up here, the pick rotation icon, it'll cancel that. But if you want to actually pick a new rotation center, you click on the point cloud where you want to rotate around. And oftentimes this will pop up the first time you do it. This is kind of generating um, what are called the oak trees to accelerate the point picking process. Uh, I usually always do yes on that. It saves time and makes things quicker. And so now you can see that we've picked a new point as the rotation center. And so now if I click and drag with my left mouse button, 
I'm now rotating around that point we just clicked and not the, the old center of the, the point cloud over there. Um, so this is useful if you're working in a very specific area and you need to just rotate, especially when you're way zoomed in like this, you can pick a new rotation center and rotate around kind of the, the spot that you're working uh, rather than rotating around the center of the whole point cloud, which can get uh, pretty obnoxious uh, in a certain sense. So those are the basics of navigation around the point cloud. It takes some getting used to, uh, to kind of get your, get your kind of sea legs, if you like, uh, trying to get, like trying to find the right view and zoom in and pan and rotate to, to look at the things and look at the features that you want to look at. Uh, but it just takes a little bit of practice to get that going. Um, so if you do want to remove a point cloud uh, from your view here, uh, you, you can do that in two ways. One is to right click on the point cloud itself and say delete. So if you do that, it'll just remove the point cloud from your view. It won't actually prompt you uh, for that you are deleting it. It will just delete it. It's assuming that you're knowing it, it's assuming that you know what you're doing. Um, I'm going to load that back in just with the defaults. Okay, so we've got that back in. So the other way to delete the point cloud is with the big red X up on your toolbar at the top. Uh, so zooming in on that, you can see this, the big red X up here is the same as delete. So whatever point cloud you have selected in your DB tree, if you hit X up here, it will delete it from the, um, from the window. So you can add in, of course, multiple point clouds. Um, I guess the assumption is that you're going to be doing this in the same uh, coordinate system in the same area. So if you have... Uh, point clouds that you want to add in all together. Um, you can add these in as separate files. So here I'm going to pick a last file to show you uh, what the import for the last file looks like. Um, so we're going to open this. And so instead of getting the, um, the ASCII import with all the different columns, uh, since last files are a pretty established uh, file standard, uh, there's just a kind of a set set um, set of attributes that you can uh, import. Um, so in this case, again, usually I just leave this as default uh, for most things. So if you say apply, it'll bring up this global shift and scale again. And so the key thing here is that the top option right here is last input. So Cloud Compare remembers what the offset was for the last thing that you imported. And so it'll apply that same uh, offset to the next thing that you import. Um, so if uh, your point clouds get off kilter, uh, you might want to double check this. But again, generally, if you're importing from the same coordinate system, the same offset will put it in the exact right place. So you don't have to usually worry about uh, changing these too often. So if we say yes on this, we're going to import this one. Again, this is about another 8 million points. So here we've got that second point cloud imported now. And so here in this case of our river, this is just, this is the river banks as opposed to the channel point cloud that we imported before. So now you can see over here in our uh, database tree view, we've got those two point clouds. So the, uh, the channel right here, so on and off, and then the banks here on and off. So zooming in and rotating again, you can start to see that this is a, a pretty nice high resolution point cloud of our river. Um, but with both of those uh, turned on, okay, again, you can turn these on and off separately if you want, okay? So to just look at the river or to just look at the banks or in a combined view. Okay. So that's how you can get in two or more point clouds uh, in the same coordinate system into the same space in your 3D view. 
So the one thing uh, you do want to be careful of on kind of slower computers is having too many points loaded in here uh, can get a little taxing for your computer uh, since it's drawing a lot of information all at once. Um, Cloud Compare will, uh, it's called decimate on move. So when you actually move the point cloud with a lot of points in the screen, um, you'll actually see the point cloud kind of go a little fuzzy until you stop and then it'll re-render all of the points in full resolution. Uh, so don't be, don't be scared if, if as you kind of pan around or zoom in and out, um, sometimes you'll see the point cloud get a little fuzzy and then come back to full resolution uh, once you stop moving around. Um, so the other thing that I want to show you here uh, before we uh, kind of call it quits uh, for this uh, specific lesson is changing the, uh, the global point size. And so in the uh, properties menu over here, we can change the point size for individual point clouds. But if there are times when you want to actually increase the point size for the entire uh, view all at once, if you just take your mouse and kind of hover in the upper left up here, you'll see that this little gray box kind of pops into life. Okay? And so it says default point size and default line width. And since we don't have any line features in here, that's not really a useful feature for us right now. But if you click on the plus and minus here, you can actually increase the point cloud size, uh, the default point size uh, to, to change this for all of the point clouds all at once. So if we zoom way, way in here and hover over that upper left corner, okay, we can decrease the point size and increase the point size um, as we need to, up to, I think, a value of uh, 15. No, it'll go higher. 16. 16 is our maximum point size. And so you do want to be careful of this because uh, if you make points up a, a cloud size point size of 16 uh, sometimes it'll start looking like a little like an impressionist painting uh, so definitely don't go that big unless you absolutely have to but sometimes when you're zoomed uh, way way in on a data set um, it can look a little weird and so by increasing the global point size uh, just a little bit you can start to see things uh, just a little bit better so that's the basics of getting some data into Cloud Compare and kind of getting some navigation uh, done around uh, the scene. So I'd recommend that you definitely kind of load in some point cloud data and uh, try out all of those things kind of in the order we talked about just to get a feel for how to navigate around the scene and how to reset the scene just in case you do get lost um, because you will get lost. I get lost all the time when I'm kind of rotated in and zooming around, I'll, I'll lose my point clouds every so often. Um, so knowing how and how and when to get those uh, standard views to kind of uh, work in your favor uh, is usually a good thing. So we'll call it good for today. Um, and I'll be back uh, in the next video with uh, some more kind of advanced editing features. And uh, we'll in future videos, we'll start to look at um, some of the more advanced analysis techniques as well.